afternoon, members. And uh, it's time for questions. The Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, and we'll start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Question one. Okay, we've got a can call you. The overall young farmer payment is capped at two percent of the overall fund, which equates to approximately six point five million. Assessment of the young farmer applications received is still ongoing, therefore the actual payment value cannot be calculated at this time. The value will be set once the number of eligible applications is established. Mr. Nesbitt for supplementary. Uh, the Minister will remember I previously asked uh, for this clarification back in May, and she told the House she needed to work out how many people had applied. Five months, five months later, uh, I must say it's very disappointing that she's not able to provide this clarity for young farmers uh, and their businesses. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, is it simply a case that she did not have enough staff in place to process this year's applications? No, that's not the case. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following on from the previous question, can the Minister give an indication of what time scale it will require before we know the number of young farmers that may be eligible to qualify from the scheme and what would be, would be the average grant aid addition that they might get from such a scheme? Um, the young farmers and new entrants and those that were prevented from being allocated payment entitlements as a result of um, force majeure or exceptional circumstances may be given an allocation of payment entitlements or have the value of their existing payment entitlements increased to the regional average um, from the regional reserve. To date, we, or we had received 2,082 young farmer registration applications, and we're working our way through those um, as we speak. There's a dedicated um, administration team with technical support who are going to take the final decisions, obviously, just around some issues of clarity around where or not you qualify for the young farmer scheme. So that's all work in hand. In terms of the top up when it comes to uh, grant aid, we're talking about an additional 10% for young farmers uh, in, in regards to the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. Thank you. And I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Um, how, how optimistic is the Minister that payments will be made in December? This is an area where I have prioritised. Obviously, um, all sectors are feeling the pinch and feeling pain at this moment in time. So I have prioritised this area of work to make sure that we continue to build on the positive work that um, I've been able to bring forward over the last two years where we've seen an increase year on year in terms of the number of people paid. My determination and my priority is again to have the maximum number of farmers paid in that first week in December and I have prioritised staff to be able to deal with that. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Number two, Mr Speaker. I am very aware of the real concerns that the levels of crime are causing amongst the farming community. I have met with the PSNA Chief Constable and the Minister of Justice on a number of occasions and made them aware of my concerns. Responsibility for tackling rural crime lies primarily with the PSNA. However, Dard's Veterinary Service Enforcement Branch assists and advises the PSNA on a regular basis concerning agricultural crime. Dard continues to work with the PSNA, the Department of Justice and the representatives of the farming community on a number of joint initiatives, including the Farm Watch um, Scheme, the Breeze Branton Initiative and the Crime Stoppers Campaign. Veterinary Service represents DARD on the steering group of a dedicated rural crime unit, which was set up by the PSNA. The unit is jointly funded by the Department of Justice and NFU Mutual. It's focusing on a range of issues from the identification of trends and patterns to, de to the delivery of targeted initiatives. The multi-agency approach has led to the recovery of stolen animals and successful prosecutions in the north and the south. The Veterinary Services Enforcement Branch assists particularly with the detection, tracing and recovery and identification of stolen livestock and has been using sophisticated DNA profiling techniques to verify the ownership of recovered animals. I am pleased to note that the PSNI's latest quarterly updates on agricultural and rural crime show that the number of offences relating to agricultural activity has decreased significantly in the last year. I would encourage farmers to participate in these initiatives and to do all they can to help secure their own properties. Anyone that has information which might help us combat this threat to rural businesses should report their suspicions either to DARD, the PSNA, the Garda Shikana or the Investigations Division of the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. Well, Mr McGuinness for supplement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her very detailed reply? And I agree with the Minister that um, in terms of efforts to combat crime, uh, uh, the whole issue of, of uh, farm watch is very, very important. But if I could leave that for a moment uh, and look at how crime has developed, 
there is a north-south dimension to this. There is a cross-border trade in goods that are stolen, uh, uh, equipment that has been stolen, uh, farm machinery that has been stolen, and also livestock. And would it not be appropriate, therefore, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the minister embarks on an intensive north-south uh, program to combat uh, agricultural crime? I agree that, um, that certainly that, that is uh, an approach that we need to take and we have been taking. I've outlined some of the initiatives that we've been involved with, particularly around um, joining up the efforts of, of all the different agencies, including the PSNI and the Garda Shikana. So there is a north-south area of work. I also, um, at a recent north-south ministerial council meeting, had quite a lengthy discussion again with, the, with Minister Simon Coveney in relation to other actions that we can take, particularly in relation to um, smuggling and fuel laundering and things like that in border areas. <coughs> I'm going to call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. Uh, can, can I ask the Minister, could she elaborate on the discussions that have taken place um, at the North South Ministerial Council level to address rural crime? <coughs> yes, we had a, an extensive discussion on cross border smuggling and fuel laundering, and that's an issue which um, I had previously raised at a plenary meeting, and then it, it was also raised at a recent NSMC Environment, Agriculture and Transport meetings. We, as ministers, noted the ongoing efforts uh, in both jurisdictions to tackle the serious issues, and we noted the introduction of a new fuel marker, um, which is obviously going to help in terms of um, smuggling and fuel laundering. We also um, noted that there was concern at an EU level, and we had um, the Commissioner for the Environment, Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, has been in correspondence with the environment ministers, both north and south, concerning the latest developments and actions taken to address the issue. So I think that um, this is an ongoing issue for us to deal with at NSMC level. It should be a stand item on the agenda around where we can work together, cooperate in terms of sharing information around practical steps, which are already happening in terms of the, the PSNI approach and the Garda Shikana approach, but I think that it's something that we need to continually keep under review. Thank you, Nicole. Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister is still fully aware that smuggling is a real issue in regards to rural crime. Can the Minister provide the House any update on what actions have been taken since the last time I raised the issue where there was over 9,000 cattle have been stolen in Northern Ireland in a three-year period? And is it time that this is actually an organised crime now? Is there time the NCA should be called on? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Smuggling is a serious issue. As, as I've said, it was uh, one of the hot topics in terms of a conversation at the recent <coughs> NSMC meeting. The responsibility for tackling crime, and smuggling is crime, is the responsibility of the PSNI. However, my department plays its role in terms of where we can assist, particularly from our DARD veterinary staff, our enforcement staff, and we've been very proactive in terms of all of that work. So in terms of um, taking on organised crime gangs, then absolutely that's something that needs to be done in terms of making sure we remove any barriers that cause, particularly in relation to food en illegally entering into the food chain. We need to remove those things because they all jeopardise the, the first-class reputation that we have in terms of food promotion and, and um, I suppose, our reputation that we have around traceability in our food systems. So any, any initiatives that um, can be taken to, to tackle that, I am fully committed to making sure that my department plays its role and will continue to do that. I will continue to engage with the PSNI and the Garda Shikana around the actions that they are taking and making sure that um, we can collectively work together where we can and also hold them to account when they need to be doing what they should be doing, which is tackling crime. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Cast ever three. Question three, please. As you'll be aware, the European Commission approved the Rural Development Programme for 2014 to 20 on the 25th of August. This has allowed my officials to issue interim local rural development strategy templates to local action groups, moving them into the final stage of the appointment process. My department has set a return date of the 31st of December. However, officials will work at the pace of the fastest on any of the 10 lags submitting a strategy before this date that meets the required standard and they'll be eligible to receive a contract to deliver later on behalf of the department. This will cut some 18 months off the setup time compared to the previous programme. Leader was extremely successful during the 2007-2013 um, programme, achieving 100% project spend and creating 996 rural jobs. This is, why the job creation, this is why job creation is a key objective of the economic theme of the leader element of the programme going forward with an overall job creation target of 700 jobs. Leader has made a difference on the ground and I have every expectation that it will continue to do so in the time ahead as we open up the new scheme. Lynch for a supplementary. Karen Coley and Gohm Gwekas Leishenera and Fregerishen. I want to thank the Minister for her answer. And I held a very successful small business seminar uh, in the county recently and there was much interest in, in it. 
Can I ask the Minister which schemes will open the first Gurn market? Yes, the, the Rural Business Investment Scheme should be the first scheme to open in each area following a period of lags um, working with potential applicants on the ground, and that's called animation. This time around, more work is being done at the pre-application stage to increase the number of successful applications that come forward. Access to basic services, village renewal and broadband then will open shortly after that. I call Mr Loris Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, min uh, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, the Rural Development Programme has been a very successful programme. Uh, could you perhaps outline in terms of the socioeconomic benefits and ensuring that uh, not only our businesses helped, but that the community and that sort of social infrastructure that, for example, in assisting with childcare uh, might be a, a feature of it, and you may be able to tell us a wee bit more around uh, some of the aspirations of the programme that's coming in? Obviously, the programme is to help create sustainable, thriving rural communities. That's taken in all, all the issues, looking at um, what are the challenges. I think, certainly from, from my experience of being out and about and visiting projects that have benefited through all the different measures over the last number of years, you can very clearly see the, the community benefits right across, you know, whether it be in basic services in a rural village for a community hall or um, helping a local business that's able to create jobs. And as I said, like the, the current programme has created about 1,000 jobs, and we want to see, obviously, a lot more of that in the time ahead. So, childcare, broadband, all the, all the different um, challenges that are for rural communities, I've, I'm quite sure that whenever it comes to, we, we set the parameters around the, the six broad themes for, for each area, but it'll be individual lags that'll decide the priorities within, their each, within each area. But um, there's no doubt about it, the benefit to this programme is second to none. One of the beauties of it is that it's community asking for help to do something, to fund something that they identify as a need as opposed to a department telling a community that this is what you need. So um, I look forward to the, getting the scheme opened. We, obviously have received our European um, Commission sign-off in the summer, which was obviously fantastic. And it allows us to um, support um, rural communities, farmers, farm businesses, rural businesses, um, the environment, and um, obviously the community and voluntary sector within all of that. So um, I look forward to getting the scheme opened as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Uh, question number four. <coughs> My department undertook a public consultation exercise earlier this year on my proposals to enhance the rural proofing process by placing it on the statutory footing. The responses received indicated broad support for the proposals. These proposals are designed to promote a fair and inclusive rural society by introducing a duty on government and local councils to consider the needs of our rural dwellers when they are developing their policies and delivering public services. My final policy proposals for a rural proofing bill were agreed by the executive on the 7th of July and since then my officials have been working with the Office of the Legislative Council to produce a draft bill which will give effect to these proposals. I am hoping to bring the draft bill to the Executive as soon as possible for introduction to the, um, prior to the introduction of the bill to the Assembly. I will be working hard to ensure that this new legislation can be introduced in this Assembly and complete its passage within the current Assembly mandate. And I'll call Mr Michael Duff for a supplement. Uh, can I commend the Minister and her Department on the excellent work in relation to the Rural Proofing Bill so far, but can I ask the Minister then further to outline what powers and what provisions will be contained in the Bill? The, the Bill itself is aimed at ensuring fair and equitable treatment of rural communities in the policy making process and it is going to build upon the existing arrangements that are already in place, um, particularly in relation to um, statutory rural, um, rural proofing. It is proposed that the Bill will contain um, a number of provisions, uh, a duty on government departments and district councils to consider the needs of people living in rural areas when they are developing their policies and delivering services, a duty on DARD to promote and encourage government departments and district councils to consider the needs of people living in rural areas, a duty on DARD to produce regular monitoring reports to be laid before the Assembly, provision for government departments and district councils to make arrangements for cooperation and collaboration to help ensure a more consistent and cohesive approach to addressing the needs of rural dwellers, Power for DARD to support rural proofing and the implementation of the Bill through the provision of training, advice and guidance. And power to make regulations to extend the Bill to non-departmental public bodies as may well be specified in such regulations. And I'll call Mr Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you Mr Speaker. And thank you Minister for your, your answers so far. Minister, could you tell the House uh, what plans you have in terms of this Bill, how you intend to include shared future? Um, proofing into the bill, uh, particularly given the number of hidden sectarian interfaces that there are in rural areas? 
As I've outlined, the purpose of the bill is to make sure that we put on a statutory foot and um, departments' responsibilities in terms of um, assisting rural communities, to make sure that um, when it comes to policy decisions, strategies being developed and at both um, central government but also at local <coughs> council level, that um, they very much consider the needs of rural dwellers. We're not suggesting for one minute that that means that there has to be a hospital in every corner or that there has to be you know, all those services, but we are saying that rural people deserve to have um, to have equality in terms of access to services, that they may need to reconfigure how services are being rolled out to make sure that they meet the, the needs of, of rural dwellers. Obviously, um, that is something that assists all members of every walk of life. Everybody in community will benefit from um, improved rural proof when it comes to policy and strategic decisions from departments. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the uh, Minister for answers thus far? Um, uh, uh, while we welcome the July uh, sign off, would the Minister reflect on the speed with which other departments are moving in the direction of rural proofing, and particularly the Department of Health? All departments have, um, there was obviously an executive commitment going back to as far as um, 2002, where um, all departments have a responsibility to rural proof their policies. I don't believe it's consistent enough right across the board, right across all departments. I don't believe that um, the veracity or the, the rigour that could be applied is always applied across all departments. So the bill is an attempt to um, make sure that it's consistent. So no matter what department is looking at whatever policy, that they have to have pay duty to the rural dwellers and the impact that that will have on rural dwellers. It puts it on a statutory footing. It also allows us to lay a report before the chamber, which will be for, um, for debate, obviously, and that will allow us to scrutinise the work of each individual department. And I do believe that um, it will lead to a situation where we have an improved access to services for rural dwellers, improved um, response from government departments in terms of um, the decisions that they take. We'll call Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, or Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister uh, provide us uh, an update on her engagement with the Education Minister with regard to the definition of rural schools? Because until the time that that definition has changed, it completely weakens the prospect of genuinely rural proofing uh, changes to our schools estate. Well, rural schools, like, it, like any other um, policy decision that any minister will take, when this legislation goes into effect, will mean that all decisions will have to be policy proofed. I have um, previously informed a member that I have met with the, the Minister for Education to discuss rural schools, to discuss um, the importance of rural schools to, to communities, quite often or maybe the only um, central meeting point for rural communities, which is why the Minister has very strong criteria that looks at purely um, the viability of schools, not purely from a numbers basis, but obviously from the basis of all the other benefits. So there's six criteria that, that he applies and links to the community is obviously a very strong um, criteria in terms of any decisions that he takes. Thank you. And Mr. Conor Murphy is not in his place, so I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Question number six. <clears throat> With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer questions six and 13 together. Um, I'm acutely aware of the difficulties facing a number of farming sectors at present, and I'm very concerned about the impact on individual farmers, their families, and indeed the wider industry. It's clear that the current crisis has been caused largely by a range of global factors that are outside of our control including the Russian ban on food imports, reduced demand from key markets and a weak euro. It cannot be solved at a local level alone. Over the past year, I've been engaging regularly with the DEFRA Secretary of State to emphasise our unique circumstances here in the North and to press her to support our case for effective and timely EU action. In particular, I've been pushing for a review of intervention threshold rates and an immediate help for the dairy sector, but I've also highlighted the plight of other sectors. I've also been liaising with our MEPs, my opposite numbers in Scotland and Wales and with Minister Coveney in the South. I've taken our case directly to Brussels and I've led a strong delegation of political and industry representatives, including our local MEPs and chair of the Agriculture and Rural Development Committee to meet Agriculture Commissioner Phil Hogan on the 1st of September. On the 7th of September, I attended the extraordinary EU Agriculture Council meeting in Brussels. And whilst there was a welcome recognition of the particular difficulties facing our local farmers, I am disappointed at the lack of detail on the package proposals that have been brought forward by the Commission. I will continue to work closely with our industry on the implications of the Commission's package and to press for swift and effective support for our most important industry. For her answer and thank her also for her efforts as well. Minister, but when we visit our super, supermarkets, we find fair trade coffee and fair trade bananas and so on. And while this area isn't a developing country, um, it's certainly at the mercy of ruthless traders. Um, what, what efforts would you make to have uh, fair trade for our agricultural produce? 
I think that um, I'm always being consistent in terms of the need for furnace and supply chain, so that means that our farmers need to not be the, certainly they feel, and some, sometimes evidence would suggest that they're the, the element of the supply chain that's continually pushed and squeezed to make, to make savings. I've always said that if we're going to be successful in growing our industry, and we have very concrete plans in place and a strategy in place in terms of the economic vision for the agri-food industry, if we're going to be successful in that, then we need to see that furnace in supply chain, and we need every element of that supply chain protected and respected and treated fairly. Um, I've asked the Agri-Food Strategy Board to convene a supply chain forum, which I'm glad is going to meet now in mid-October, which will bring together the, the farmers, the processors, the retail association, bring all the players in the supply chain together to start to um, open that communication, to have forward planning so that farmers aren't continually surprised whenever different retailers maybe decide that they have a different ask this year as compared to last year. So I think that we have um, a good opportunity to strengthen, um, to strengthen the, the, um, the, the, the supply chain and make sure that farmers have a fair representation and a fair um, conversation with, with that whole supply chain. Alongside of that, um, there's an ongoing conversation with retailers around buying local. I think that that's a, pro a, a promotion that we can be involved with. I've written to all executive ministers asking them to ensure that were there opportunities within departments to um, tender for supply of food, for example, that they also look towards and try to facilitate, where possible within the European rules, the, the um, local businesses. So I do um, think that we can do a lot more work around um, promoting and, and, and I suppose encouraging people to buy local product where they possibly can. I call Mr. Loris Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Minister, you detailed uh, a number of meetings and conversations you've had in, in your answer so far. I just wonder, in terms of the product uh, arising from those uh, discussions and meetings, perhaps you give us some insight as to the achievements that have been made. Uh, I appreciate the difficulties, and you may, it might be helpful if you could make a particular reference to the dairy farmers in particular and the help available to them. As I said earlier, and when I made a statement to the House, that um, this is a crisis that's been built in the farming sector for quite some time. Um, it's not something that we've arrived at overnight. Going back as far as last year, I've been meeting with the banks, I've been meeting with um, the feed merchants, I've been meeting with the farming unions, all around um, how do we collectively tackle what is effectively a global market crisis. A lot of these factors are outside of our control. The strength of the sterling against the euro, the um, Russian food ban, China not buying so much, oversupply of milk in the market. All those factors have led to the, the price that our farmers are receiving to, to be at such a low level that it's really far below the cost of production. So I have been very active in making sure that um, in dealing with both DEFRA and England that we highlight the fact that we are unique. Our farming sector, our dairy sector is unique. We export 85% of everything that we produce. Um, I've clearly been consistent in lobbying the EU Commission on the need for a review of intervention prices. Unfortunately, what the Commission put on the table on the 7th of September meeting fell far short of what we wanted to see. They have now announced that there's going to be a 500 million pound, 500 euro um, package for farmers, but when you distribute that against uh, out into 28 member states, it's not going to equate to a very large portion of funding. I think it's the wrong approach from the European Commission. I believe the Commission could have took a decision to review the intervention prices, which would have helped the market to recover itself, because the stick and plaster that they've now put on the, on the issue is going to mean that we'll be back having this conversation around the dairy sector in, in, over the future and years to come. It happened in 2008, 2009, it's happened again now and it will happen again. So without the Commission taking that action, um, I, I feel that the proposals they put on the table fall short, although every little bit helps, particularly for, in terms of trying to get some cash flow into the sector, but um, it fell short of what we expected to see. However, I haven't given up on that issue. Other member states are also supportive, and we continue to, to, to push the Commission to review intervention prices. Alongside that, we do all the practical work that we're doing on the ground. Our CAFRI advisors are out working on the ground, working with farmers. We're going to have a farm business improvement scheme, which is going to be up to £250 million to help farmers to modernise and, and to help their farms. Thank you. That was a very important question, which <laughs> needed a detailed answer. But I'll remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister has just touched on my point, which was with regard to the €500 million Euro package, which does appear attractive at face value, but once, as you say, it's divided across the 28 member states, it certainly declines quickly. Of course, then, when it's divided again across the UK's allocation and subdivided into the, the four regions, can the Minister then provide an update on what discussions she and her senior officials have already had with DEFRA? with regards to Northern Ireland's allocation? I have um, 
con consistently raised the issue with the DEFRA Minister around why we're, di we're different, why we're different, particularly when you compare us to Scotland and to Wales and even to England. Given that we export 85% of everything we produce, we are obviously a lot more um, susceptible to the market forces and to the volatility in the market. I've been successful in, in, in getting um, the other regions to actually recognise that um, we are different and that we are unique. So I would like to think that, that will play it through in terms of the discussions. We still don't know what the, the allocation from Europe is going to be. If I used a very um, rough, and it is a very rough calculation, if you take Britain and the north of Ireland, we probably produce about 10% of the EU uh, milk product. If you took that as a very um, crass calculation, you'd be talking about £50 million, which then obviously would have to be distributed between Scotland, England, Wales and ourselves. So um, I have written to the DEFRA Minister on the back of the um, EU Commission meeting. I've written to the Commissioner also to try and establish exactly what our allocation will be. But I will not be found wanting in making our case. I do believe we're different. I do believe that we should um, receive an allocation which is proportionate to the fact that um, we export so much product. So I will certainly be making that case. As I said, I've written to both the Commissioner and to DEFRA, and I will be having that discussion again with Liz Truss, the DEFRA Minister, in the weeks ahead. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sam Gardner. Okay, Mr. Speaker, question seven. I meant to ask I grouped it with. Okay. So, with your permit, when the Farm Business Improvement Scheme is designed to help drive competitiveness in our agri food sector and will be an important part of the North's New Rural Development Programme for 2014 to 20. <coughs> The Farm Business Improvement Scheme will be a package of measures aimed at knowledge transfer, innovation, cooperation and capital investment, which will help support sustainable growth in the sector. The Farm Business Improvement Scheme will have a budget of up to £250 million and will include business development groups, farm family key skills, European innovation partnership groups, innovation and technology, demonstration scheme, farm exchange visits and an agri-food producer cooperation scheme and a business investment scheme. We are planning to roll out the Farm Business Improvement Scheme package in a phased way with the approval of the Rural Development Programme by the European Commission last month, my officials are continuing to work hard in order to open up the first phase of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme measures later this year. This first phase will include the establishment of the business development groups for farmers. This scheme will encourage farmers to learn about and enhance their knowledge of business management, new technologies and innovative ways of working, which will assist them to think clearly about their farm, their income and their future. We are also planning farm family key skills training schemes, including farm safety and business planning in this initial phase. These knowledge transfer measures will help farmers to think carefully about their business plans and will help to prepare the way for the proposed business investment scheme, the capital programme that is planned for next year. I call Mr Gardiner for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister thus far as a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her response? And can the Minister provide some comfort for farmers that if this assembly was to be suspended, is she confident that the business improvement scheme would still be available? Well, I don't think we should have that kind of defeatist attitude. I think we're, we're all elected to show leadership and we're all elected to work together. And I think that um, the talks process has now opened up. I think that um, we all need to show leadership and we need to work together and we need to find a way forward to represent the needs of the, those people that, that elect us. In terms of the scheme, I'm committed to making sure the scheme opens up. We have a lot of work. We've been working very hard over the last number of years to get us to this position. The fact that we now have the European sign-off is obviously something that's very welcomed, and I want to work with farmers around helping them improve their efficiency and their productivity when we get this scheme open later this year. Thank you. And I call Mr Alec Atwood. Question number eight. Surveillance and testing for ash dieback has been undertaken since the first confirmed findings of the disease in recently planted ash trees here in November 2012. In the north, as of the 7th of September 2015, the number of positive sites confirmed is 93, including 64 in forestry plantations, 3 in nursery trade, 9 in urban amenity sites, 3 in road sites, 10 in private gardens and 4 in hedgerows. Current scientific understanding suggests that the conditions for spread in the wider environment exist on the island of Ireland. To date, there is no evidence of spread to mature ash trees locally, which is something that will obviously be welcome. Mr. Atwood, for a supplementary. I appreciate that, Mr. Speaker. Um, given the pressure on indigenous wood production and supply, and the scale of exports coming into the country, and the fact that all the estimates are that very quickly we will become more and more dependent upon imports of hardwood. Can the Minister outline 
given the nature of this disease, what is the strategy to replant in order to reduce the dependency upon imports of hardwood? There will be a forestry scheme that comes forward under the new rural development programme, which will allow us to be able to bring forward a, a grant scheme that will help farmers to, to plant trees and hopefully um, working with forestry service that will be trees that are less susceptible to disease. It brings us to the end of the period allocated for, uh, for listed questions. Uh, members listed for topical questions uh, 2, 3, 7, 8 and 10 have withdrawn their names. And I call Mr Colum Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answers uh, thus far. Can I ask her, though, given the current political circumstances, is she still confident of getting the, the decentralisation of the DART headquarters to Bally Kelly as soon as possible? Yes, I'm fully committed to, to that project. We've done a lot of work over the last number of years in terms of developing outline cases and doing all the groundwork. Um, staff are, are very keen to move, obviously. There's quite a, a demand within the um, the public sector for people who want to be able to work in the North West. This is going to be a tremendous benefit for, for those people. Um, we had record numbers of staff actually indicated that their willingness to move. That means that there's more opportunities and there's a further distribution of public sector jobs. The member will know that I'm very committed to this project and um, I hope to be able to let uh, go to tender in terms of the actual contract um, over the next number of months. Mr. Eastwood for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister uh, for that answer. And I think she knows well the number of people getting the the six o'clock bus from uh, Foyle Street in Derry. Does she, will she support a, an executive-wide uh, decentralisation programme uh, where all departments would be, uh, would be asked and, and, and hopefully would be able to deliver a, a level of decentralisation to areas like the North West and other areas with high unemployment? And I, I would support that. I think that um, for, at the core of, of this decision and the fact that I have moved Forestry to Fermanagh, um, Rivers Agency to Lockery and Cookstown, Fisheries to Down, <coughs> And headquarters going to Bally Kelly shows that um, I have um, can, t can um, show that I am absolutely committed to delivering on the decentralisation of public sector jobs. We have to see more of that. This will be the first department to move completely out of the Greater Belfast area, and I want other departments to consider that also whenever it comes to potential changes in the future. It is only right and proper that there is a fair distribution of public sector jobs, and that rural communities get to, um, to avail of the benefits of the increased footfall of, of people in their area the potential construction jobs that are created, the ongoing servicing of buildings. So all those benefits should be um, felt and enjoyed by people from right across the north, no matter um, where you live. Thank you. And I call Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And probably a little bit of a personal obsession of my own, but I, I have a great interest in the development of forestry in Northern Ireland. And I would like to ask the Minister, in relation to the whole issue of forestry, um, what proposals has she got, and indeed the Forestry Service, in terms of developing uh, a sufficient amount of uh, trees and, and forest, uh, and not just in terms of number, but also in terms of quality? What proposals has she got, and uh, could she uh, outline her view in the development of forestry in Northern Ireland? Well, the Forestry Service has very clear targets in terms of the, the <coughs> planting that we want to see over the, open to 2020. There is a, a strategic vision and a, and, a, and a document set out, and I refer the member to the DARD website where you actually can, can see that link, where it very clearly sets out our, what, what are the department priorities, what areas are we looking at. Um, we're obviously, as I said earlier, we have an uh, opportunity with the New Rural Development Programme to look towards grant aid for, for planting. Uh, and um, I know that um, many farmers are looking with interest in terms of um, that scheme coming forward. So there's quite a significant body of work that the Forest Service do, but I do refer the member to the strategic um, business plan that the Forestry Service has, and it's on the website. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I hear what the minister says, and uh, obviously there, there, there is a business plan there. But given the fact that we are uh, developing, uh, that our economy is developing, uh, given the fact that the construction industry is uh, developing uh, and growing, uh, perhaps not the same at uh, the pace that we would like, but nonetheless growing, does, she, uh, does the minister believe that in fact there is sufficient uh, timber production that will meet and serve the needs 
of the economy here in Northern Ireland. It's been raised with me in terms of um, any concerns. Um, my Forest Service work closely with the, the industry, they work closely with the mills, they work closely with all their stakeholders in terms of um, developing strategy and looking towards the future. So that is not an issue that, that seems to be being highlighted in terms of as a, as a concern. However, I think any plans are moving forward, you have to be able to adapt to changing circumstances. You have your strategy in place, you have your vision, you have your targets, but you have to be able to be adaptable, obviously, to the local economy and, and to those needs. Um, if the member has any particular concerns which he wants to write to me about outside of this, then I'm very happy to, to receive those. Thank you. And I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for Agriculture whether she supports a ban on hunting with dogs? Well, our position has been very clear that um, we continue to oppose blood sports, that, um, and that means that includes uh, dog fighting, badger baiting, cock fighting, bull fighting. However, uh, my party position would be that, in terms of acknowledging the support in, the rural, in rural Ireland for um, initiatives such as her coursing, we believe that her coursing practices should be regulated to ensure sustainable. Um, to ensure sustainable wildlife management and to minimise any sort of unnecessary suffering. So absolutely opposed to blood sports and that maintains is my position. Mr Little for supplementary. Thank the Minister for her response, but would she not agree uh, that the hunting uh, with dogs is indeed a cruel, inhumane and ineffective uh, approach to wildlife management and to animal welfare? And will she bring forward uh, legislation to be debated in this Assembly on that issue? The member will be very aware that um, I have brought forward some of the strongest animal welfare legislation, both um, started by my predecessor, Michelle Givenu, and then myself. We have brought forward um, some of the most stringent legislation, and we have actually committed to reviewing that to make sure that where there are bad practice, where there are um, incidents of animal cruelty of any form, that there is action and there is ability for um, agencies to step in and take action. I have um, previously responded to a debate in this House. I think maybe the member possibly brought it forward where we discussed um, a review of the legislation. I have done that. We are bringing forward an interim report. But I do think that there are opportunities to strengthen the legislation that we have, um, even though it is very strong, particularly when you compare us to anywhere else in our neighbouring islands. Thank you. And I call Mr Loris Kelly. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'd be grateful if the Minister could give us an update on uh, the targets that her department is currently, uh, has currently reached in relation to the Better Regulation Review and trying to reduce red tape. I'm very happy to provide that to the member in writing. I don't have those figures with me, but I'm very happy to provide it to you. Supplementary then from Ms. Kelly. It's hard to do a supplementary on that except to welcome uh, that uh, update. Uh, but would the Minister, uh, in providing uh, that uh, update, give uh, some insight as to the amounts of monies that could be saved, uh, or indeed uh, time and effort, uh, by uh, the farmers in, in actually uh, the reduced uh, reduction sorry, in the red tape? <laughs> I was looking for areas where we can improve um, things and, and make things simpler and remove any sort of bureaucracy that's there. One recent example is the fact that we're now brucellosis free. That allows us to re relax the testing regime, which is a saving of £7 million to the industry. So obviously that's something that's very significant. But as I said, I'll write to the member in terms of the targets and where we're at in terms of achieving. Thank you. Call Ms. And can I ask the, uh, the minister if she'd like to give us a review on the uh, recent admission from the British Navy that they were involved in an incident uh, with a fishing trawler in our glass back in April, uh, something which they denied at the time. Um, the fishermen involved were, were very fortunate to survive that incident. Um, after such strong initial denials by the British Navy, I'm appalled that it's taken them five months to actually admit that it was their responsibility. When the incident happened, I visited the trawler, the owner and the skipper at the time to see for myself the damage that was caused to the boat and subsequently wrote to both the Secretary of State and the Minister for Transport requesting that the matter was fully investigated and, um, in order so that we can prevent any further potential incidents. With the admission just as recently as the 7th of September, I issued a press release. I called on the MOD to explain why denials were issued and explain their evasiveness. I don't think it's good enough that they sat up for five months knowing this is what happened. How were um, the industry able to protect themselves against it happening again? So I have... Um, Severe, que severe questions, I think, for the British MOD in terms of their approach to this and why they left our, our fishing industry 
susceptible to something like this happening again and potentially a fatality because the incident was quite severe five months ago. So I think that um, there are questions to be asked. Um, I'm certainly determined to make sure that I ask those questions and that we get to the bottom of and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, I thank the Minister for her answers. Um, and can I ask the Minister um, if she can elaborate on the further action that she is prepared to take to ensure that such incidents do not happen again? I have written to the British uh, Minister of Armed Forces seeking a full report. I am asking them why the submarines are operating submerged on the fishing grounds and to build confidence in the fishing fleet. I have requested that fishing industry representatives are fully engaged in terms of changes to the submarine protocol. I fully expect also, um, just to say, I fully expect that the, the Navy will address the issue of compensation to the Wills family, who obviously were the, the fishing family that were uh, impacted at this time. So we need answers, we need a full report, and we need guarantees that this is not going to happen again. Thank you, Minister. And uh, that brings us to the end of topical questions. Uh, as the next period of questions does not begin until 2.45, I suggest the House takes its ease until then.